Hi. Um, technically, we're uh, 15 seconds early, but I think we're probably safe kicking off now. Um, welcome to Building for a Post-Mobile World. Um, it's not as quite as apocalyptic as it sounds from the title. Um, but a lot of this session is about the concept that um, the transition to mobile is no longer some sort of future event that we are thinking about or some sort of, you know, wacky world that gets written about in Wired magazine or something like that. It's here. And if we are building a mobile site today, we, by the time it launches, we're going to be facing new sets of problems that are emerging on the horizon already. So thinking about what the world looks like after mobile is no longer some crazy shiny new thing, but just multi-device usage is just a reality, is what this is all about. Um, so I'll, I'll do a quick introduction before, we, uh, before I kick things off. I'm Eaton um, on Twitter and Drupal.org and all sorts of places. Um, I'm with a company called Lullabot. Um, I've been with them for about seven years doing Drupal stuff um, pretty heavily. And um, we're a company that um, does like strategy and planning work, uh, design work, um, full Drupal site build outs. And we also do teaching and training stuff, both for um, you know, large clients and for you know, individuals and groups and stuff like that. We've been, again, doing it for quite a while. It, it, it's, we start measuring things not in years, but in what Drupal versions we were using when we started. So Drupal 4.5, represent, anybody? Anybody? For yes! Uh, now we've got images. What else do we need? Um, but yeah, we work with um, a fairly large number of different clients, ranging from tiny ones to, to big ones, media, publishing, education, you know, small startups. Um, and well, this is sort of the, the braggy big wall of logos. But the, the idea behind it is that in the work that we're doing with them, we end up seeing a lot of these same patterns in terms of the, pr the problems they're experiencing with content, especially as they have to deal with um, the proliferation of devices, the transition to mobile. It's not so much that mobile phones are changing everything, it's that they break all of our existing sites and it terrifies us all. Um, I'm going to attempt to ratchet up that terrified sensation for a little bit in what I like to call the shock and awe portion of the presentation. Um, you might want to leave now um, if you are just building sort of web app-like functionality, stuff that's not particularly content focused, but maybe using Drupal behind the scenes or whatever. Um, that's awesome, but there probably will not be a whole lot interesting to you here. This is primarily about sites that are heavily content oriented and need to maintain and keep their content updated and are trying to deal with mobile and a multi-device world. Um, if you are Karen McGrain or someone who basically goes around talking about structured content and content reuse 24-7, you will probably also not find anything new in here, but you're f you know, feel free to stick around and heckle. Um, and if you terrify easily, it might be best just to step out of the room for like maybe the first third and have a friend give you spoilers, because um, there will be terrifying statistics. Um, otherwise, stick around, and uh, if you want to heckle me, feel free to tweet with the hashtag postmobile. Um, that's it. So, change. How many people here um, have been hearing about the fact that mobile is important for a while? Okay, cool. Um, that's good. Th that's, those are good things. Um, how many people here are working for organizations that haven't, in fact, built a mobile site despite talk about mobile being important. Okay, so there, there's a few hands, but you know, that's good. It, it, it feels like one of the common myths that's still floating around is that mobile is some sort of thing that will be happening off in the future. It's still like, you know, oh, it's like taxes, you know, I'll eventually have to take care of that, but for now, it's not a problem. That's terrible financial advice. Um, the, the idea that a shift to mobile is something that lies off in the future rather than right now is just flat out untrue. It's a myth and it's dangerous if we hold that. Oh, there's, there's already someone heckling? 45% mobile users? Someone in the back of the room just, this is the opposite of heckling. This is giving even better statistics than the one I have. <laughs> 45% um, um, of the traffic to one of the attendees' sites um, come from mobile users, according to their Google Analytics stuff. That's fantastic. 
Um, and you may be saying, oh, well, but not my site, you know, not most people's sites. That's exceptional. Um, just as a little bit of background, 88% of people globally have a mobile device. Well, no, wait, I'm sorry. In the US, and it mostly averages out to the, to the first world. Um, in, in Australia, um, there are roughly 1.3 mobile devices for every person. Um, <laughs> I was impressed when I looked that up. That I, kudos to all of you. Um, you're really just, just wow, mobile. 45% um, of those people use their mobile device to access the web. That's a ridiculously high number when you consider the fact that only a few years ago, the idea of a mobile phone that could actually look at websites without exploding in flames was a new and radical idea. So that uptake is really, really coming on fast. Even more interesting, 17% of those people are mobile-only users. Literally, the primary device they use to look at the web, websites, government service websites, everything is their mobile device. And that also spikes when you look at specific demographics, like um, you know, anybody under 20, um, a lot of minority groups inside of the US. I'm not sure, I was trying to dig up some details uh, here in Australia, but I couldn't find any more detailed breakdowns. But there's a lot of interesting stuff about specific countries, um, you know, demographics and age groups that are even higher of using only mobile devices to, to see the web. Um, I, I don't know how to put it any clearer. Those numbers are going up, not down. And especially for government agencies, educational institutions, anyone who cares about the fact that someone could actually be locked out of the content they're publishing, the fact that that rising number of people use mobile primarily means that you can't simply assume that it's some sort of convenience or some sort of adjunct. You know, that it, it's something that you have to account for and have to consider. And also interesting is the fact that 90% of those people who use the mobile web split their tasks and split their usage over multiple devices. Now that goes a little at odds with the mobile only use, but th it, the idea is that even people who are using multi de multiple devices um, are using many of them together. And that kicks the, kicks the, is it a ladder, props? It destroys one of the um, other common myths that there are somehow special tasks that people do when they're mobiling or that uh, you know, mobile phones, well, that's what people use when they're running through the airport. You know, when they really want to read something, they use their computer. Or when they want to do real work, oh, that's, you know, they use other things. Mobile phones are what they use in some sort of magical mobile context that will, you know, just push off. And this is the kind of thinking that leads a lot to having a mobile site that is like the 10% of the most popular pages on our website. We'll just trim those down and format them for mobile and stick them there. Well, that doesn't really bear out. Google actually did some really interesting research um, last year, um, a study with about 1,500 participants, which is a pretty solid sample group. Um, of the people who use mobile devices, 90% used multiple devices to accomplish a given task. 77% of people watched TV while using a mobile device, which means that they weren't in fact running through an airport, they were sitting on their couch, or perhaps in the living room, doing something and also doing something at the same time on their mobile device. They could have been looking up information about the show they were watching, being distracted, whatever, but it was a multi-device usage pattern. And there's even more interesting stuff. 60% of those people started shopping on their phone. They looked something up, they found a product, and then they continued the same task by going to their PC and purchasing that product that they found. 25% of people searched for something on their, P on their desktop PC and followed up later by going and reading the same article when they had five minutes and they were just wandering around. 15% of people planned trips on a tablet, you know, flipping through, looking at pictures, you know, trying to find flights, and then later booked on a PC. You know, there's a, there's a long, long article, that, a research paper that Google put out about all of this data, but the long and short of it is there aren't any kind of special tasks that people do on mobile. There's just tasks that people happen to be doing on mobile because that's the device they have. And then when you account for tablets, that even muddies the water even more. You know, 
Is a tablet a mobile device or is it a, like a, a living room device? Who knows? We'll call it mobile now because it's just easier, but that's another question we'll talk about later. Um, another issue that um, it's really troubling, I'll say, is the fact that with the proliferation of devices, um, responsive design is getting overtaxed. Um, how many people here have been hearing a lot about responsive design? Okay, I want to go on record and say, it's good. Do not misunderstand what I'm about to say. I'm not knocking responsive design. Um, the problem is, is if we assume that simply putting like a responsive theme on a Drupal website or doing a responsive visual design is going to solve all of our content problems, we're putting way too much weight on what amounts to a set of useful CSS techniques. Um, this is uh, Luke W. He's a um, consultant and designer, and he does a lot of blogging on mobile issues. He and a couple of other um, friends got together, and they pooled all of their devices and uh, stacked them in a, a, a giant, horrifying display of just how many screen sizes are out in the wild right now. It's funny, and it's like, oh, they're geeks, but Think about just how many different screen sizes are represented in that one photograph of what happened when a dozen nerds emptied their pockets and their laptop bags. That's an example of what responsive web design is being asked to deal with at this point. It's a very, very useful tool for ensuring that your site doesn't just explode in flames when somebody is using a larger or a smaller device. But the proliferation of viewports and devices is really, really a big challenge, and we can't simply assume that responsive techniques and media queries are going to be able to continually scale to handle all of those things for us. So that's another one to tuck back. Um, who here has worked with someone who said, oh, no, 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 we've got a mobile strategy. We're going to make some apps. OK, yeah. And, you know, and again, I don't want to knock apps. I have roughly 895 of them installed on my phone. I use them a lot. They're great. Um, the problem is when we start to think, you know, same as with the responsive design issue, that it is some sort of like magic sauce that we can just spread on our website and on our content, and that will, bam, solve mobile problems. Um, an interesting thing is there's a lot of statistics coming out about how much time people spend in apps, but it turns out about 75% or 70% of the time people spend in apps is either playing games or using an existing social networking site, which means there isn't just some sort of like mother load promised land of like user attention sitting out there that if you make an app, bam, you're, you know, there, it's, it's gold rush time. You will be able to get, it, get people's attention and they'll use it. There are 400,000 apps in the Apple, in the I, iTunes App Store with zero downloads. Just, you know, <sighs> yeah, this, is, this isn't the fun part. The, the happy part is coming later, I promise. Um, and to go along with that, the average development cost for a feature-rich app, um, like, you know, magazines or, you know, an organization trying to publish their content in, you know, a, a reusable way, um, runs from about $30,000 to $150,000, the development costs and maintenance costs for the app itself. And that means that if someone is thinking that just putting out an app is just going to solve a bunch of problems by virtue of now we have an app, there's real costs associated with that. And not just up front. One of the biggest challenges is that apps require content too. Unless you're just making like Angry Birds or something like that, um, you're going to need to maintain the content that will be displayed in that app. And unless you're planning up front, it's very easy to get into a situation where you've now developed two forked versions of your content. One that you're publishing on the website and one that you're publishing for your app. Now, you know, we're mostly Drupal people in this room, I'm guessing, and you say, no, 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 no. Never, never, never do that. No, we can just put nodes into things. We, yeah, that's not a problem. But, um, I've also seen a lot of sites that have different pools of content on the site. One intended for mobile, one intended for the website, and editors have to maintain both of those in parallel. That's content forking. You now have two separate independent pools of content, often with duplicates, that you need to keep track of and maintain. And the time investment for the actual content editors to do that isn't free either. That's an ongoing cost. 
So that's definitely an important consideration. And that applies to making a dedicated mobile website. You know, the, we'll just take the 10% of the really important pages and make a website out of it too. Anytime you're, make, you're carving off some sort of special thing just for mobile, you have to acknowledge that that's at the very least likely. If you don't plan to prevent it, it will happen just via inertia. And the one, that, the one that's really sobering is that these new publishing channels, new places where our content shows up, or new places where people want to go and get the content that we're working with as individuals and as organizations, those just keep coming. And people just keep coming up with crazy, weird ways of tying into content that's out there. This is, I am not kidding, this is the BMW iDrive, I believe. It is a car with Twitter and Facebook. You're all thinking, someone's going to die. This is just, this is a terrible idea. And I would agree. But lo and behold, it's out there. And they've been working on tools that allow you to put rich content into an automobile. This is the uh, refrigerator that I believe Samsung introduces every year. The internet refrigerator. It's, it's a great idea. You know, OK, I can put recipes on there. But it's also just got a web browser and social media and recipe reviews. If you're doing any of those kinds of things with, con you know, with content, well, here's a channel where people may actually expect to be able to look at that stuff. This is Drupal.org on my Xbox in my living room. If you, thought m if you thought transitioning your design to be touch friendly was a pain, friendly with dual analog stick controllers is even more annoying for rollover menus. Um, and, you know, the, okay. So Microsoft rolled out Internet Explorer to everybody who owns an Xbox. That's fantastic. But why do I care? You know, what, what are the odds of that actually being used? 40 million people have paid subscriptions to Xbox Live globally right now. In the US, we've got a bunch of different cable providers for cable television. Xbox Live has twice as many as one of the largest cable providers in the country, and the PlayStation Network has twice as many as Xbox Live. Those are people with web browsers who have those things in their living rooms, and some of them are actually starting to use them to surf the web. Like it or not, this is out there, and all of these different channels are only coming faster and faster. People are finding newer and crazier things to jam web browsers into. People are coming up with new devices, little weird glowing blobs that sit on a nightstand and can receive pings from Twitter and like start blinking if, you know. It, no, seriously, I think it, someone was showing me that. My, my boss, Jeff Robbins at Lullabot, he loves tr keeping track of those things. He has several little weird glowing blobs that can receive pings from Twitter. He loves that stuff. And they are part of the ecosystem that we have out there. Now, yes, press releases are not likely to show up on the glowing blob on the nightstand. But at some point, almost all of the content that we have, if someone actually cares about it, which hopefully we're making content that people care about, um, they're going to want access to it on another device. Um, Karen McGrain, um, in a recent article on a list apart, I think put it really well. She said that people don't want different content or less content, or content that's been tailored for the device that you're on. They want the same stuff presented in a way that they can find it and navigate it with the device that they're using, but they imagine it as a window onto a thing that they want access to, not a separate little container full of its own content. You know, if you have, oh, if you've got two separate websites, one that's for mobile with a little pool of content over here and one that's on desktop, the minute somebody decides, oh, well, I want to go and read that article over, oh, well, the URLs are different. Or, oh, this one, all the URLs start with M. So I'll go to my desktop machine. And I've got this nice little pillar of content striped down the middle of the screen. Nobody likes that. For better or worse, the content that you create the content that you build and publish has to be able to adapt to these changing and emerging channels. That was the shock and awe portion. This was the, the, the bitter pill. If you've, been, if you've just been thinking, OK, we finally got the site to look OK on an iPhone. Woohoo! Yeah, there's, there is a lot coming. The good news, the fantastic news, 
is that there are actually solutions to this problem. This is not just, you know, this is not about, congratulations, our new product can reformat your website for mobile or something like that. Um, the White House uh, in the US, uh, Dries actually mentioned a couple, of, um, a couple of initiatives that the White House has been doing um, in, in actually making he pretty heavy use of Drupal. Um, one of the interesting things that they've done is put a really heavy emphasis over the last several years on making sure that government data is accessible and, and open to people who want access to it rather than focusing on trying to throw up a new website that presents a particular chunk of information in a form that's going to get stale after two years. Just figure out how to make, the, make information open and accessible first and then figure out how to present it after that hurdle has been crossed. Um, they actually released a digital government blueprint late last year, and they said that rather than thinking primarily about final presentation, they want to emphasize an information-centric approach that just, you know, focus on getting the content right, make it available, and deal with the rest as an adjunct to that. And that's a really important philosophical shift for those of us who came from, like, uh, publishing or a marketing background. I, I did my time in the marketing minds before I started working, you know, in, in technology. And, you know, that was all about. You made static files, you made brochures, you made these things that were artifacts of a bunch of decisions and, you know, written, you know, written pieces, and it stayed where it was. And that's, that's not the way things are working anymore. So the question is, is how do we actually do that? What are the actual concrete steps that organizations are taking to try to achieve that end of making their stuff available and then dealing with presentation later. The first and biggest challenge, the thing that has to be uh, a baseline priority, is prioritizing the idea of cross-channel reuse. And wh what that means is when we look at all of the different places where our content may need to appear in whatever form, we need to make sure that we're trying to reuse the same underlying piece of content on all of those channels rather than creating a different one for each one of those channels. So I, I have a, a fun little icon-based illustration of this. Um, this is a vault. It contains all of your awesome ideas. Those are all of the places where you want it to go, or at least three representative ones. Print, mobile, desktop, stuff like that. A lot of organizations very quickly get into this situation. They've got their ideas and they've got people working on writing different chunks of content for each one of those different channels. It gets turned into concrete documents. Maybe uh, if you've been in publishing, you probably have watched the scenario where there's a print CMS for the magazine and there's a digital CMS for the website and then there's some sort of horrible monstrosity that someone hand coded over a long weekend to drive the mobile website. But all of those are just separate things that people have to put content into. And they may be reusing content, but they're copying and pasting from one to another, essentially creating parallel documents that have to be maintained independently. Now, some organizations try to solve this by saying, excellent, we will just tell one person they have to do all of it. We will just add new steps to their workflow for each channel we want to publish to. For some values of works, that works. But the problem is, is you're basically trading how much gets done for how many channels it gets done on. You know, a person who's being told to do all of that stuff, they're not going to be doing as much. The throughput of all of your content and your publishing and the work that you can do drops dramatically as editors have to deal with that. And every new crazy thing that gets hot and everyone says, oh, well, we've got to have a, a social strategy or we've got to have a what's it strategy or whatever, that becomes another one of those channels that those overworked writers and publishers and editors have to deal with. And that's not cool. This is what we want to get to. A workflow where every one of those channels that we're publishing to is a different permutation of that underlying piece of content. Now, this is probably not really radical if you're used to working with Drupal. The concept of nodes and, you know, you know we, we even have things like, you know, build modes for nodes where you can say, oh, I've got the teaser, I've got the primary view of the content and stuff like that. We're, we're, we're already doing a lot of those things. But it's still important that we remember that the, the high level issue here is we need to prioritize that principle of reusing the same underlying piece of content across all of our channels as much as possible because that's the only way to deal with this multi-device proliferation. 
Um, a really cool example of an organization that's doing this um, in the U.S. is NPR, uh, National Public Radio. Has anybody heard of COPE? They're, uh, okay, yeah, a couple of hands going up. It's like the, the granddaddy of all structured content um, case studies. Uh, it stands for Create Once, Publish Everywhere. And uh, it, it's sort of the internal system that they've built to accomplish those reuse goals. This is an example of an NPR story on their desktop website. It's about some teenagers who figured out how to like do printable solar panels using like maker tools. Awesome. This is the mobile version. It's a responsive site, so you know you t pull it on a mobile browser, and it's cool. It just adjusts the layout uh, appropriately. That's their actual iPhone app. It's the same story in their iPhone app. You can see at the bottom they've actual got, actually got playback controls because this is an interview, so you can play back the audio. And they're using all the native appy features that they can, but it's the same article. This is the Android app, same thing. You can see that there's some different design de decisions that have happened there. They're using the native Android like navigation buttons <coughs> instead of the iPhone standard you know, row of various clickable bits at the bottom. Um, but same content. Here is a partner website, Minnesota Public Radio. It's sort of a sister station to the NPR website, but they pick up and syndicate stories from NPR. Here's the same story being displayed on their website. This is a microsite they have for the particular show on NPR that carried that article. Lo and behold, same thing being used on that website. This is their YouTube channel. They push the video of it to YouTube and have the same basic description. This is what happens when I paste a link to it into a Facebook post. It automatically pulls in a preview image, a short tailored chunk of text that describes the article in the number of characters that Facebook says they have to use to describe that. All of these things are just different views on the same underlying chunk of content that NPR maintains and publishes internally. It's a single resource in their CMS. They're not using Drupal, it's all homegrown, but the principle is one that we can still leverage ourselves. But how do they do that? That, that sounds tricky. The way they accomplish it is actual meaningful structure in how they've modeled their content. Um, and this is where I sort of you know, mentioned the idea of things like build modes and content types and you know, fields. We're used to describing a lot of our website content in those terms, but there's an important distinction in using those things simply to model a particular design that we were handed or we came up with and using those tools in Drupal to model the underlying meaning of a piece of content in a way that we know is going to be used to remix and reshuffle individual elements to come up with a particular appropriate way of presenting it, rather than, okay, scrap it and let's rebuild that for a new design. I, think, I like to think of it as sort of the difference between a jigsaw puzzle and uh, tangram puzzles. Has anybody ever played around with tangram puzzles? It's basically just like little triangles and squares. It, it, the whole idea is that you can technically make anything out of it. Whereas a jigsaw puzzle, well, it's a particular picture. And it's broken up into little pieces, but if you try to assemble anything other than that picture, you're sort of out of luck. An example would be a kitty cat. We're internet people, so we gotta have a cat in the presentation somehow. But you can also turn it into a rabbit if you want to, and there's all kinds of examples of people doing tangram art. I like to think of it as a useful analogy for how structured content can be used. If we break things down into pieces that we know are going to be used to in, in various kinds of remixes of our content, we think about it differently than just stuff that needs to go over here in this design or things we will need in a callout block. If we're thinking about them as structural elements rather than presentational elements, we get that remixing capability. This is uh, a little nerdy, but this is the actual underlying structure of what NPR stores in one of their COPE articles. Um, they've got the high level structure for what things that they care about, what things their system models. The story, like a, a given article or story, is for them the single most important piece of content they have. They also model something called a program, which is like a show that they're running that may have lots of different stories associated with it, or a series if they're doing a bunch of different stories that sort of build on each other. And they also have blogs, but those are just 
things that they use to group stories. That's really their key asset. And they have a bunch of different fields that they've modeled on that. And I, I won't drill into all of the details, but some interesting examples are subtitle, title, and short title. They've got three different kinds of title broken out, not because one is displayed on mobile. We had one client who actually had title, iPhone title, web title, and RSS title broken out in their content. But the problem is, is well, what happens when you add yet one more channel? Are you going to add another title? NPR has, a, has tackled this by saying, we want a title, a subtitle, and a short title. We're going to write one for devices that have a very, very tight constraint on how much they can display, and we may want to use it there, but we're not going to talk about which device or what presentation style. We're going to talk about what we're putting in it and what it means and how it relates to, the st to this particular story. They've got teasers, mini teasers. The uh, Facebook preview text that you saw when I pasted that in there, that was the mini teaser. That's what they expose via Facebook's open graph tags. They show the full teaser when you look at you know, um, an article in a listing on their web page. So if you look through, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Thumbnail, publish date, stuff like that. They also have more complex elements like audio that can contain a number showing how many seconds long the audio is, a link to the MP3, a description of the audio file itself, They've got images, they've got pull quotes. The pull quote can contain attribution for who said it, stuff like that. But these aren't, I mean, this isn't some sort of magic template for what you should go and model on your site, but they're an example of how a particular organization looked at one of the key content types they built and said, what's really in this? What's the stuff in this chunk of content that matters? And how can we start carving out little meaningful bits of it in a way that will allow us to effectively remix a given story for different purposes? Oh, man, there was a cute little animation that was supposed to come after that. We'll just see. So you've got structured content. You've got all of these different ways of displaying stuff that you can at least theoretically accomplish. But the additional challenge is, okay, well, we've got a CMS that can store all these things. We've you know, gone into a back room, argued for two weeks. We've got structured content now, um, and we want to reuse everything. But how do we actually get it to all of those different things in a way that doesn't end up cloning and forking all of our content anyways? Um, and that's where the concept of decoupled delivery comes in. Um, this, this idea goes by a lot of different names. Some people call it web services. Some people call it APIs. Some people call it feeds. You know, we want to give feeds to our partners or whatever. But the whole idea is that the management and the creation and the organization of your content shouldn't be inherently tied to how you're presenting it. Now, we use Drupal, which is about as coupled as it gets in terms of managing the content and displaying the content. But still, we'll, a little later we'll talk about some of the ways that we can still leverage this effectively. But the idea of decoupling our delivery from our management means that when we start building things on the edges, like a new app that displays our content or whatever, we're not retooling the underlying foundation of our site, we're building something cool on the edge that can consume that content. And NPR, you know, still rolling with this example, all of that structured content that they've got is exposed at api.npr.org. If you go to that site, you can create an account, you can get yourself an API key for free, just like, you know, being a Twitter developer or something like that. And then you can just go to api.npr.org and start writing queries against all of NPR's content. You can say, I would like field, I would like the title and teaser fields in NRML format, which is just a particular XML format they use sometimes. You can also say, I want it in JSON, or I want it in Atom, or I want it in just flat HT, I want it in pre-formatted HTML. You can ask for it in a bunch of different ways. And I want article ID whatever. That's actually a real article. Um, and what you get back is structured HTML. That particular query is, this is actually the result that you get back from, NP, from NPR's API. And you can see it's a lot of the same stuff that we were talking about. It's got, you know, different links 
the, um, the full link of the native story on NPR's website if someone just wanted to click and go to it. The API link, if you just want to say, oh, well, what's the link that I could then check to get all of the data associated with this? You can do a bunch of stuff. It's got the title, the long teaser, the mini teaser, because that's what we asked for. You could ask for all of the fields. You could ask for articles between one date and another date instead of requesting one by ID number. Um, the whole idea is that they've untethered having content from displaying content by putting this API as a middle layer. And all of these different examples are pulling from that same API. They're just writing queries. Sometimes they're caching the results. They may save them locally on the iPhone app so that you can actually read them after you, you know, when you're offline or something. But that concept of using those, that API as their gateway between stuff we need, to, you know, stuff we're experimenting with, you know, the iPhone app, the new website that we just launched, um, and their core content is a really huge thing for them. Um, so what's the payoff? You know, they invested a lot of time and energy in building this system. They, you know, they've, they've clearly put a lot of person hours into building and maintaining it. Um, and for them, it really has paid off well. Um, they recently did an interview uh, with, I think it was uh, Mashable, where they were talking about some of the end results. And for them, in, in like one year following rolling out the API, um, they were able to double their audience um, because it gave them the flexibility to work with advertisers and other traffic, you know, traffic generating partners in much more flexible ways. They were able to launch 11 new products that used NPR content, like you know, apps and you know, widgets for other people's websites and stuff like that. And they did a full site redesign in 12 months with a very small constrained dev team. And having that API was the only thing that allowed them to do that. It allowed them to build on top of a known system for pulling what they wanted and what they cared about, remixing it as needed in a design that they could come up with without having to worry about re-architecting all of the underpinnings of it every time they had a new endpoint they needed to work with. So the takeaway is A, structured content, B, reusing that structured, those structured content assets, and C, exposing them in some way so that another tool out there can consume that content and utilize it without you having to rebuild your core system. Those three principles together are really, really key to dealing with this whole like multi-device explosion thing. So it's, it's, a, it's an icon of a happy bouncing baby. He's gonna explain how we're gonna do this with Drupal. So, um, some of you may be excited. Um, others may be thinking, this sounds like a monstrous amount of work. And this sounds like I'm going to have to write views handler plugins and learn how to do things with XML and JSON. Maybe I'll have to learn how to configure rules module. Who knows? Um, the good news is actually that Drupal is pretty well positioned to do a lot of this stuff. You know, I mentioned earlier that our community is actually pretty used to dealing with things like structured content and is familiar with the concept of a core thing being displayed in lots of different ways in different contexts. And a lot of the tools that we've accumulated over the years are actually really well suited to this approach. We're just not all used to using them in that particular way. And that's the shift that we need to start getting used to if we want to leverage this stuff. So the first really important principle for doing this in Drupal is when we're modeling things like content types, fields, relationships between content types, we need to make sure that as much as humanly possible, we're modeling the meaning of the content, what's in it and what it's used for and why it's important to the organization, not just the appearance that we're envisioning in the design that we're currently implementing. You know, Photoshop-driven content modeling tends to go off the rails pretty quickly when you get a different Photoshop file six months later. Um, anybody who's done like database modeling or was involved in like the semantic markup wars uh, or has been cornered in a bar by Morton 
um, at any point is probably familiar, familiar with some of these basic concepts of like modeling semantic structure in HTML rather than modeling the appearance and using CSS to style it. Database administrators talk about, you know, how do you model core business objects and, you know, treat the data model rather than just fire hosing stuff into a giant table. These are all concepts that, you know, different disciplines have used. And I think we can start leveraging a lot of that of a lot of that learning when we talk about working with our content types. Um, another useful tool is thinking through how a design or how a plan for a website is going to be filtering, sorting, searching through. How do we envision a user going through the website and locating the stuff that they care about? If there's a web, if there's a page that we say, oh, well, this page will contain all of the news articles by a given user's friends that are in, you know, involving subjects that they care about. Okay, well that's, you know, I think there's probably four people in the room going, oh no, no, that's gonna be three weeks. Um, but from a content modeling perspective, we can immediately learn things that we're going to need in our content model. We're gonna need authorship, because things by a person's friend implies that there's an author. We get that for free in Drupal, but that's something that, you know, is being modeled. We're going to need things like, what topics do, does someone care about? Well, that means we need to attach topics to a given piece of content. You know, th those are things that we can start extrapolating from the views that we have and the listings that we have and how we envision people getting at stuff. Use those things to discover what the content model needs to bring to the table before we even talk about you know, how we're going to skin it. Um, Build modes, again, are a useful starting point when we're thinking about different ways something could be presented. If we look at a content model that we've got, you know, the fields and the structure of a content type, and we think, huh, how many interesting and useful build modes could I make out of this in Drupal to present this content in a nice way? It's still very HTML-centric because it's, you know, we're spitting out web pages, but those build modes can be really, really useful. And we also use them for things like the search indexes and the RSS feeds and stuff like that. Another one is if you see recurring markup all over the place in body fields, like here's the giant chunk of stuff we always paste in when we need to do a pull quote or when we need to put the photo in a given article, those are often indicators that there is something structural that we're always doing with a given type of content that it might make sense to split out into a given field because there's recurring meaning there that if the design changes, well, God help you, because now you've got 8,000 articles that all have heavily design-oriented markups splatted into a body field. And it's a lot easier to redo the template for a field than it is to go through and search and replace hand-marked-up HTML inside of a body field. That's, I, I don't think that should be news to anybody who's been working with Drupal, but you know, it's, it's an important thing to keep, to keep an eye open for. And yes, this is also where the pre-scheduled um, tickets sold in advance rant about WYSIWYG editors comes in. Um, one of the biggest problems is that WYSIWYG editors, now, not all WYSIWYG editors, not all WYSIWYG editing, but at least most use of a WYSIWYG editor, when it's not carefully controlled, um, leads to design being jammed into a chunk of content body content, and that's bad, because with any kind of multi-channel publishing, the what you see part is not going to be consistent and reliable from one device to another. The what you see is going to be radically different on a tiny screen, or a black and white Kindle, or any one of, any one number of the different channels that we can push stuff out to. So if you put a giant table in the middle of a node body using a WYSIWYG editor, well, that's problematic because that table is not going to look good on anything other than a machine with a monitor at least this wide. And, you know, sometimes that's unescapable. But the advantage of WYSIWYG editors, the what you see is what you get, breaks down when you're going to be pushing out to a bunch of channels. And that's problematic. I like to call it the, the problem of Dreamweaver fields. Basically, the, you know, this is the body field, and we've enabled every possible button on the WYSIWYG editor because someone just said, I need to do this crazy thing and paste my Microsoft Word document in there. Just let me. Okay, great. This is the Dreamweaver field. You can go use it. Problem is, is that kills reuse. 
content built in that way is fundamentally unremixable. You can't leverage it in the ways that we've been talking about. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary. But if it is, understand and acknowledge that those chunks aren't going to be something that you can really effectively leverage using any of these approaches. Um, my, uh, my usual preference is like to, if someone needs WYSIWYG editing and wants it, make sure that, there's, that it's stripped down and only allows really basic HTML formatting. You know, let them do headings, basic styling, emphasis, strong or bold tags, links, things like that. You know, stuff that's basic and structural, but make sure you haven't left like, you know, table editing and the ability to paste random CSS and things like that in. You know, that, that kills any kind of remixing ability because you end up drifting towards structure being jammed in as design-oriented HTML. We've also found it really useful. A lot of the WYSIWYG editors that are out there allow you to build custom plugins. You know, you can add your own little button to that WYSIWYG editor with some code that lets you insert canned markup if you want to. If you still need people to be able to insert stuff using a WYSIWYG editor, wrap it in a plugin for TinyMCE or CK editor that lets people click, I want the calculator widget there if you need that, instead of just copying and pasting a giant slab of HTML. So, in addition, and this is something that you're probably going to be hearing a lot of during the content authoring track, I, uh, I, I sort of buried the lead here, but um, support content editors, not just emotionally, but also with tools. Um, I like to say that they're the most important users of any website that's content oriented, even more so than any individual visitor, because if content editors stop working with content and publishing it and updating it and maintaining it, the reason the visitors come starts rotting. That content is no longer being updated, no longer being published, and you're out cold. Anything that supports the work that they do and smooths the work that they do and ensures that they can focus on doing what they need to be doing, not necessarily, say, trying to do design and layout in a WYSIWYG editor, is useful. One thing that we found useful is trying to make sure that we identify tasks for the content editors, things that they do on a recurring basis, not just individual forms that as developers we're used to you know, customizing and building. The node form is definitely ripe for tweaking and smoothing and improving, and a lot of work has gone into that in Drupal 8. But it's also important to keep in mind that in a large website that's been heavily customized and has all kinds of crazy stuff going on, creating a node is rarely a standalone operation. Often they have to connect it to other things, schedule stuff, you know, work with somebody else to make sure it goes into the right places on the site. Understanding that that is a comprehensive task and a workflow for them, not just a form that lets them insert things into the database is really important. And figuring out ways to simplify things like managing relationships between nodes and editing metadata can also really help. There's modules out there that can do things like pre-populating keywords automatically on nodes by you know, scanning the content and stuff like that. Those are really helpful sometimes. Accounting for things like you know, multi-step processes that editors have to go through, those, those are traditionally painful things. We've had huge wins just by having quick dashboards that we threw together with views for editors that just said, what content have you edited in the past month that is not yet published? Just show that in a view in the administrative section. And they were overjoyed because that's, a, that's part of a workflow. And out of the box, Drupal doesn't do that. I'm not saying we should, can, we should have that page in Drupal, but look for those kinds of opportunities. Because often from a dev perspective, it's easy to whip that up, but it's hard to do work without it there for an editor. And also, tailoring and refining these kinds of things iteratively. If you're someone who actually works in an organization over the long haul, not just doing like you know consulting or site builds, you have a lot of opportunities for evolving and, and iterating these tools that the editors have to use on an ongoing basis. There's a lot of value for that. You don't have to somehow come up with the magic, awesome, El Grande editorial workflow tool of doom and just you know, throw it over the wall and say, hurrah. You can do, you know, get small wins. It, it works. It makes sense. The third principle is exposing and using data feeds. 
APIs don't have to be super wacky and crazy and complicated. If you have public information or public articles or stories that you want to publish and make available for reuse, you don't have to bend over backwards and do lots of crazy stuff. It can be as simple as using a tool like the Views RSS module to customize exactly what fields show up in the RSS feed and add additional things like media RSS feeds or geotagged stuff to your RSS that's going out. That can be reused and remixed in useful ways. There's also a great module called Views Data Source that lets you expose XML or JSON or Atom feeds that you can customize every little chunk of data that goes out in that view feed. Just like, it, you know, just like NPR has done. Um, well, perhaps not just like that. There might be a little bit of custom code to do that level of stuff. But still, you can get a lot of stuff in, in place just by throwing together useful views. And if you've ever built a view with exposed filters, where you can have filters and sorts and stuff like that that come in in the URL, you've got something very close to the kind of API endpoint that NPR exposes their content with. You can use views to, views to build simple content APIs. And if you want to go further, there's tools like the services module and the content API module that was built on top of services. They're great examples. You can even publish content to your website with those tools. So you could have an iPhone app that lets you post and manage articles using something like the services module. More complex to set up, but there's already underlying tools to help support that. You can also consume that data not only on crazy iPhone apps and stuff like that, but in your own website. You can use the feeds module to pull in those data feeds. If you've got several sites that need to share content, set up a feed on one of them, import it into the others, and now you have a content API. It may not be as fancy as NPRs, but you know, it can get the job done. And also, you can simplify certain scaling and performance issues by exposing cacheable content feeds and using client-side script to consume data from them and expose things like widgets of content, uh, widgets of new stories and stuff like that. In JavaScript on the, on the client side of your own Drupal site, you can consume that site's feeds if you want to go super crazy. Lots of possibilities. The idea is expose lightweight feeds. That doesn't have to be a huge engineering task. You can just do it with views and then start utilizing them. Get used to that idea and you are I would probably say like, you know, let's say 75% of the way to having a useful multi-platform content reuse strategy. That, that's something to put on the year-end report. Um, Drupal 8 also has a lot of really cool stuff coming down the pipe. Um, web, the web services initiative, the ability to expose JSON feeds. You won't even need to have extra modules other than core to do that kind of stuff in Drupal 8. There's a lot of potential for it. Um, a lot of people are going to be talking about that this week, you know, here at DrupalCon too. So pay attention to them. But all of those things, you know, I if you want to start de dealing with these ideas in Drupal, the principles to remember are that design-neutral content models. You know, you building content types that don't assume that a particular visual design is the only thing they're going to be used for is a critical first part. Exposing structured data feeds so you can reuse that structured content in cool ways when you want to. And then building good editorial tools to support the people who will actually be creating and managing that content. Because structured content also implies lots of fields sometimes. And figuring out how to smooth out the experience of you know, editing and maintaining and working with that content is important. So building for a post-mobile world. What's the, what's the high level stuff? One. Reuse your content, the same piece of content, rather than little forked off clones of it going in different directions. That will dramatically simplify the management and maintenance work that is where a lot of real long tail costs for maintaining content comes from. Um, put the purpose and structure of your content before the visual appearance when you're thinking about how to model it with content types and fields. Um, tailor your editing workflow wherever possible. The Drupal node form is, you know, it's not a scary monster, but it's generic. It's not in any way informed by the nature of the work that people working on your website need to do. And there's great tools to build custom workflows around that. Take advantage of them. And then expose feeds with that structured data to simplify experimentation. Reduce the cost of coming up with a crazy experiment for Android and stuff like that. 
I think one of the interesting uh, examples NPR mentioned was they now have a WordPress plugin that uses the NPR API to auto-publish stories from particular shows on any WordPress sites for NPR affiliates. There is also an NPR Drupal module that does the same thing. If you're setting up a website and you want to syndicate content, you can pull in all of those discrete fields as a Drupal content type, display them however you want, because that NPR API can be tied into all kinds of things. They didn't have to rebuild all of their infrastructure in order to build that little experimental thing on the edge. And reducing the cost of those experiments means that you have a lot more slack when dealing with new and crazy stuff that emerges in the world of mobile or, you know, I don't know, eyeball implanted browsing technology, whatever people come up with. If you can experiment on the edges while your underlying structure stays consistent and reusable, you've made a huge win. It's, it's really, really good to, to, I don't know, I'm just repeating myself now. Good stuff. If you're looking for some additional reading, there are three really great books I can highly recommend. Content Strategy for Mobile by Karen McGrain. Um, it's sort of a, it, it's a great book to hand to like, you know, your, your VP, if they're trying to say, I don't know why we need this, we've, we've, got, a, we've got a mobile site. I, think I feel like I should like, be wearing a newsy cap or something when I use that voice. Um, but it, it, it's a really good high level overview about the whys of some of the structured content stuff that we've been talking about. The book Content Everywhere um, by Sarah, De oh wow, I'm gonna mispronounce her name. Her name is Sarah and it's an awesome book. I pronounced it correctly on the podcast, and that was the last time, I think. But it, it's, it drills a little deeper into some case studies and some good examples of how different businesses have tried to break down their content that way. There's also APIs, a strategy guide. Um, it's an O'Reilly book about some of the challenges and issues to deal with when exposing content APIs for services and any kind of API. It's you know, by a couple of people who've actually done that on a lot of large organizations. It's great stuff. There's also a bunch of links. Um, I'm not going to bother reading through the links, but uh, if you want a copy of these slides, go to lb.cm slash postmobile, or uh, go to the DrupalCon website, and I believe these slides should be uploaded now. Uh, I believe we've got four minutes, maybe four and a half. We'll see. Uh, if there's any questions, go for it. Yes? That's a great question. It, it, because Drupal is so coupled and has HTML publishing baked in, it's you know, what it does out of the box, do people get misled about what the nature of Drupal's system is? I, 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 think, I, I don't think they're misled so much because for a long time, Drupal has been a web publishing CMS and there's a lot of other tools out there like that. Um, I think it's almost by, by happy accident that we're so well positioned for this structured content shift. You know, if you go back to like tools like FlexiNode and how, heck, the Node system itself, you know, the Drupal community has been thinking about content in a lot of these ways, and we're now starting to mature into a place where we can actually leverage that effectively. Um, it still takes work because you can easily build a highly coupled, non-reusable Drupal site if you know you aren't thinking about what you're doing. Um, but I, I, I do think that that's not something that's obvious to people who haven't been neck deep in structured content for a while. Any other questions? Yes? Yes. Um, dang it. The question was, do we have any success stories for how Drupal has served as the back-end CMS while other systems served as the front-end um, in, in that sort of decoupled approach? Um, I know this sounds like a cop-out, but um, the one most recent success story I can think of is totally NDA'd at the moment, and I can't actually say what it was. But I will say it was a very large, um, a, a very large, uh, sports thing that needed to deliver lots of content to lots of devices um, and they wanted to do this you know this sort of like multi-channel approach 
and Drupal is being used on the back end for all the content management stuff. They're using another provider to do video streaming. But Drupal is the hub that organizes everything. But even the desktop and mobile websites aren't being generated by Drupal. They're HTML, JS. They're basically a lightweight web app using you know, basic you know, you know, CSS and HTML5 and JavaScript frameworks. But it pulls from Drupal. Um, so it, it's an example of that. Man, I gotta figure out when we can talk about that. But it's it's cool. Yes. Oh. That's yes. The the I, um, yes. That's an excellent point. There there is another project we worked on the uh, Martha Stewart Living website, which is ginormous and extremely pastel colored. Um, and it basically, they have two sites. All their user generated content, commenting, rating stuff, you know, building your own recipe book, stuff like that, and their primary editorial content server. And they weave those things together when they actually put out their website. All of the user generated content is a Drupal site, but a different Drupal site is pulling it in via content feeds to actually display. For them, it's a safety and security issue. They never have to worry about users ever touching their editorial server, but they're using it basically like build your own discuss commenting server in Drupal. You know, and I, I think that's that's you know one example. There's a lot of different ways to slice and dice it, but you know, once you've made that shift to putting your content out there in a number of reusable forms, you have a lot of opportunities to experiment with those kinds of things that uh, it, it's startling. You start seeing it everywhere. It's like, you know, you, you now have a shiny new hammer and there are so many nails. Um, I think we're flat out of time. Um, so I think we got to close this up, but I'm going to be wandering around and, and if anybody wants to ask or chat or talk about, you know, cool, cool examples of these kinds of techniques, that'd be great. And feel free to take a pony from the back table. You earned it.